This section about types of sets has a few definitions that I think are worth going over. Admittedly, this first one, the one about the empty set, it shows up here, although it's actually more relevant in the next section, the one about proper subsets and things. But this is where it shows up in the Newton notes, so I figured I would try to keep everything consistent. So the empty set is just a set with no elements in it. And there are a couple of ways to write that symbolically. The one with the two brackets with nothing in between, I suppose would be the more literal way of saying empty set because you have that set notation and there's nothing in it, right? It's empty. The other way of doing it, which is actually probably more common is to write it like this, where you have what looks like sort of a, a circle or I guess it kind of looks like an oval with this type setting, um, but sort of like a circle with a diagonal line through it. Um, both of those, things there, um, those are two separate ways of writing the empty set symbolically. Um, the next thing is um, what a subset is, in general, what a subset is. So if S is just some set, like it says there, um, then um, a subset basically would be a set that is an entirely contained within S. So another way to say that, and I guess the more thorough way is kind of how I have it written, where Another set A would be a subset of S if every element of A is also an element of S. Um, so then, just to make this a little bit more concrete, if S is the set consisting of 1, 2, 3, and 4, then these are all going to be subsets of S, right? Because A here, 1 and 2, both of those are an S, right? So every element of A is also an S. And it's okay to have other stuff in S, right? For it to be a subset, that's totally fine. It's just that whatever is in A also has to be in here. B also works, right? Three, one, and four, they all show up in here. C, that looks a little bit different because it only has one element, whereas the set consisting of just four, but that still works, right? Sometimes people get thrown off by the one element subsets but just because they look kind of different. So I figured that was worth throwing in there. And then the other two. So D is the same thing as S, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But every element of D is in S, so it's a subset. Um, and then the last one, the empty set, that has no elements. So to say, well, every element in the empty set is in S, that's vacuously true because the empty set doesn't have any elements to begin with. Another way to look at it is when would a set not be a subset? Um, well, if it had some element that wasn't in the original set. So since there's nothing like that here, I can make one. So let me just say, what if F was this? Like what if it was just three, one, and five? So it looks like B, except it has a five instead of a four. That is not a subset of S because it's got that five in it, right? So we have an element of F that's not in there. So that's another way to look at why the empty set is a subset because this thing with the five, it never happens. It can't. There's no way to have something that's in the empty set that's not in S because the empty set doesn't have anything in it to begin with. So that empty set is a subset of every set. So under these two notes, you can see it. It's the second one. Um, that's always going to be a subset. Like if you have to figure out, you know, what are the possible subsets or how many there are, the empty set's got to be one of them. And the original set does too. So any set is going to be a subset of itself because anything that is in a set would therefore be in that set, which sounds like I'm talking redundantly, which I kind of am, but that's why it works, right? Um, by definition, that still holds up. Even though usually when you think about set, subsets, you think about things like A or B or C probably, where it's part of S but not the whole thing. And that is a subset, but it can also be the whole thing. All right, next, a universal set. Um, this terminology actually means a, something a little bit different if you go farther into set theory, but we'll go with it. Um, so a universal set would be one that contains all elements of interest. So a lot of times those are sets consisting of a bunch of numbers, like the set of all natural numbers could be a universal set, or the set of all integers, or the set of all rational numbers, things like that, set of all real numbers, right? All those things we had in that first set of notes, um, like right at the beginning of it, those would all work. Um, but then just to have one that's not numbers, 
What if the universal set consisting of all communities in Cochise County that are classified or designated as cities? Like that's going to be our universal set. There are only six that have that city designation. Um, and they're right there. So Benson, Bisbee, Douglas, Sierra Vista, Tombstone, Wilcox. So then if we want the subset um, consisting of cities that start with a B, right? We can take subsets out of this universal set pretty quickly, right? You just go, all right, well, it's the first two. Yep, that's it. Um, and then the subset S consisting of cities with a Cochise College campus would just be Douglas and Sierra Vista. And if you've been to the Douglas campus before and you're looking at that and going, that's a bit of a stretch to say that's in Douglas. I would agree with you, but it's labeled as being in Douglas. So even though it's way outside of town, we're going to say it's in Douglas. Um, I guess if you wanted to have a different one for the centers, because um, Benson and Wilcox have centers, right? You could make that. Um, and so then you would have a set consisting of Benson and Wilcox. So you can do stuff like that too. Um, but then I think that's about it for the definitions. So now getting into the examples, um, this first example, we've got two pairs of sets in each one and we just wanna see, is there any sort of subset relationship? Like is one of these sets entirely contained in the other one? So the way that I do it is I kind of gravitate toward, if there's a smaller one, so like A and B, C and D, in each of those cases there's one that's smaller, I kind of gravitate toward the smaller one and then see if those numbers show up inside the big one. Because then if all of them are there, then you've got a subset, right? So 3, 8, and 12. Well, there's 3, there's 8, and there's 12. So it looks like we're good, right? It looks like what we've got is that A is a subset of B. So A is a subset of B. All right. And then if we go the other way, um, so with C and D, I'm going to go right to left this time because D is smaller. So let's see if we've got them. So M, that's right there. P is at the front of C. R is right next to the P. And then Z is right there. So yep, everything that's in D is also in C. So D is a subset of C. And certainly you couldn't go the other way, right? Um, C is not gonna be a subset of D because you've got a couple of elements of C that don't show up in D, right? The X and the B, that would throw that off. Same thing with part A. You couldn't go in the opposite direction because B has four and 11 in it. They're not an A, so B is not gonna be a subset of A. And then what if we go down here? We look at P and Q, um, well, they're the same size, so let's just see what's in common, right? So P's got a two, Q's got a two, and then they both have sixes, I guess I could underline those but other than that they're different right p's got a four and an eight those don't show up in q q's got a five and a nine those don't show up in p so this is a situation where it's neither so so neither and i guess i can write this out like the other ones so i'll say p is not a subset of q and then I'm going to do this the lazy way with the, the quotation marks that Q is also not a subset of P. Right? Because when you have two sets, it doesn't have to be the case that one is a subset of the other. Right? They can be like this where neither of them are subsets of the other. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? It happens. All right. That, I think, would be it for that first example. Um, the next one, which of the following subsets or subsets of W up here? So I put some numbers and then some, I guess you would call them special characters in there, right? The things that you get when you press shift. So we just want to see, okay, well, is everything in here in W? And we're just going to kind of do that every single time. So is this going to be a subset? Well, if we look at those four characters is the dollar sign up there yep that's there right so i guess i'll make little check marks maybe this time that's in there 49 you look up yeah that's in there it's at the end of w 33 is at the beginning 25 i guess is kind of in the middle so yeah they're all in there right so this one that's a subset okay what about the next one well 33 is in there 16 is in there 
plus is in there because it's toward the end. Percent is not. So no percent. I'll make an X on the percent. Um, so that one is not a subset because we've got an element in this set, the percent symbol, that's not in W, right? You look up here, there's no percent up here. Um, the 16 by itself, that's fine. Again, I wanted to just stress that you can have a set consisting of one thing. It looks weird when you're writing it out in roster notation, there's one thing in it, right? It feels like it should be longer, but that's okay, right? It's okay to just have one. So we just got the 16, but that is in W. So this is a subset. Um, D, if you look at it, it's W just written nicely because I put all the numbers first in order. And then I think the symbols are in the order if you go left to right across the keyboard. Um, so the, the pound sign, dollar sign, ampersand, and plus. So all of these are in here, right? It's the same elements. So really this is equal to W, but any set is a subset of itself. But I guess I could put this in here. That is W and that is a subset. And then the empty set, well, that's a subset of every set, right? Because it's impossible to have something in the empty set that is not in the original set since the empty set doesn't have anything in it to begin with. Okay, then next, which this is kind of the reverse of two. So instead of um, here are a bunch of sets, which ones are subsets. Now we have the thing that's supposed to be the subset. So T consisting of three, five, seven, and 11. And we wanna see which universal sets um, T would be contained within. So let's see, looking at A, um, and then basically you're just checking to make sure three, five, seven, and 11 are in it. So three's in it, 11's in it, but five's not in here and seven's not in here. So really just any one of those, if only five was missing or if only seven was missing, that would be enough to throw this off. But since they're both not there, I'm just gonna write it as no five or seven. If it was just no five or just no seven, you would get the same conclusion as what we're about to get, which is that T is not a subset of A. And that's because you've got something in T that's not in A, right? Five, for example. That's in T, not in A, so T can't be a subset. What about B? Let's see, so three, five, seven, and 11, looks like they're all here, right? Because there's three, and then five and seven are next to each other, and 11's at the front. So that one looks good, right? So this one looks good. So I guess we'll say T oops, is a subset of B. Okay, then the set of all odd integers, I guess you could write this one out if you wanted to, like if you wanted to write this in roster notation. So odd integers would include negatives, right? So I'm gonna have the ellipsis on the front and maybe negative five, negative three, negative one, then one, three, five, and it'll keep going. Right, so seven will be in there, nine will be in there, 11 will be in there, so it looks like we're good. Um, so yeah, this is gonna work, right? And another, you can do this one without using the roster method because you could just say, well, everything that's in T, those are all odd integers, so it looks like we're good, right? That would also work. So we'll just say here that T is a subset of C, and then D is the set of all positive integers less than 10. Well, that one is gonna be trouble because, well, three is a positive integer less than 10, and so is five and so is seven, 11's not. So, let's say 11 is not an element of D. And then that would imply that T is not a subset of D. All right, um, so that takes care of number three. Then there's a definition here, which it almost looks like it, it's circular. 
Um, but our notes get into like in the, the the Newton notes, they get into the difference between finite and infinite sets, and this sort of thing does show up in the homework. So a finite set has a finite number of elements, um, and an infinite set has an infinite number of elements, right? And you go, well, yeah, it seems like that's what those names would mean. Sure. Um, so what that would mean is that if you wrote out a finite set um, using the roster method, you would be able to eventually stop, right? Like maybe it's real short. You only have four elements. It doesn't take that long to write it out. But, you know, you could have one with 50 elements. That's still finite. Um, and then if you wrote out a set using the roster method and you couldn't stop, right? Like eventually you just had to put an ellipsis in there and say, you know, I'll never be able to finish then that's infinite, right? So um, of the possible um, universal sets in three, which are finite and which are infinite? Okay, well, if we go back up and look, um, A and B are obviously finite, right? Because you look at this, you go, that's got six elements in it. This has eight. Um, and then this has nine, right? Because if you were to write out D, it would just be the second system of, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. This is infinite, right? Because you couldn't write out the set of all odd integers. This would just keep going indefinitely in both directions, right? Positive and negative. So um, I guess what we can have here, and you can talk about like cardinality, like the cardinal numbers and stuff too. Um, so like the cardinality of A is six. So that one, is finite, and then the cardinality of B was eight, so that one's gonna be finite. Um, but then C, which we'd already written out, we said that that was gonna look like this, so I'll just kind of rewrite what we had before. So ellipsis, then negative five, negative three, negative one, one, three, five, and so forth, right? Seven, nine, 11, it just keeps going. That one is infinite. And then D, if you want to write it out in roster form, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is certainly finite. All right, so that's got a cardinality of nine, but the important thing is, is it finite or infinite? It's finite. Okay, then Number five, so one's where we start fresh instead of um, back-referencing another example. So you have to be careful about um, what number set is being used um, to kind of phrase the sets that you're asked about. Um, that's where you have to be kind of vigilant with this homework assignment because A and B look almost the same, except this one says natural numbers and this one says integers. That's going to make a difference. Because the natural numbers, just in general, are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so forth, right? The counting numbers. So the natural numbers less than 5, if you wanted to write this using the roster method, you'd have the set consisting of 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that is finite, right? It's got four elements. So that one is finite. Then the set of all integers less than 5. This is where you got to be careful. One, two, three, and four are in there, sure. So is zero, and so are the negative integers. Because any negative number is less than five, right? So negative one, negative two, negative three, all those got to be in here too. So if you're going to write this one out, I guess really it would look something like this. So I'll have the ellipsis, then negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, and then you'd have one, two, three and four. So on the higher end, it does stop, but on the lower end, it just keeps going, right? Because all the negative integers are going to satisfy this. So infinite. Okay. C, you can see the whole thing. Um, it's got some weird stuff, right? I mean, I've an integer, a decimal, a fraction, um, a color, and the paragraph symbol. Um, which actually has a name that's called a pilcrow. Um, not that you need that to answer the question or anything, but I just like saying that out loud. Um, but altogether, there are just five elements, right? So you go, well, five elements, that's finite. 
So, I guess to write it halfway formally, I'll say the cardinality of s is 5, right? So that's finite. Um, D, so 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. That ellipsis is going to cause trouble, though, because that means you just keep going. So 40, 41, 42, 43, and so forth are all going to be in there, and you're never going to stop, right? There's no upper bound, in other words. And that means that this one is infinite. All right. Then E. E is tricky. This is why E is last. It's the hardest. Um, and I'll tell you the answer, and then we'll go through why, because the why... Um, that's actually the important part. Um, e is infinite because the set of all rational numbers where that's any number that could be expressed as a fraction, right? Um, so the reason that this one um, can kind of throw people off, I think, is just because that interval looks really small, right? From zero to one, you go, oh, that's not very big, right? There can't be very much in there. It doesn't really feel like it, right? Intuitively, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of stuff in there. But if you were going to try to write this out, um, and I'm actually just going to start writing out numbers, and I'm going to leave out a ton, but I can make the argument for why it's infinite pretty quickly. So if you're going to try to write this out, and these won't be in the conventional order, so you'd have 0 and 1, right? Because it says inclusively, so you're going to have them in there. 1 half is a fraction that's between 0 and 1, but if I go halfway between 0 and 1 half, that's 1 fourth, so that's got to be in there. I go halfway between 0 and 1 fourth, that's 1 eighth, so that's got to be in there. Halfway between 0 and 1 eighth is 1 sixteenth, that's in there. Halfway between 0 and 1 sixteenth is 1 32nd, that's in there. Um, so you could just keep doing that, you're never going to run out. And notice I didn't even bring in like 3 fourths or, you know, 7 eighths or anything like that. Um, because notice what I'm doing. In order to get a number in between, I'm just doubling the denominator. And you can always keep going, right? And you could say, well, then what about 1 over 64? And then 1 over 128 and 256? Right? You can just keep going. You're never going to finish. So this is infinite. Even though when you look at it just in words, it looks like this interval is really small. Right? It still ends up being infinite. Um, the term for it is density. Right? Like between any two rational numbers, you get another rational number. Right, because you can always um, basically just average the two and you're going to get another one um, and you can express it as a fraction. So it, that's what it's actually called. But um, with ones like that, um, I think the best thing to do is just start writing stuff out. Right, that's the best way to figure it out. And then if it's one that's infinite, like you'll notice and you'll be like, wait a minute, if I keep doing this thing, I'll keep getting stuff that works and I'm never going to finish. Right, if that happens, then it's going to be something that's infinite.